Hey guys, in this one we're going to look at close combat in Carnivale. Have you ever wondered what, how to stab someone in the head with a sword? I have. He has. And we're going to cover it here. So, if you're following along with the download of the rules or you've got the rule book, check out page 48. So, first thing for close combat is, to be in close combat with another miniature, you have to be in base-to-base -base combat, or base-to-base -base contact, okay? Which means if you do a charge and you fall an inch short or something, well, unfortunately, that's that. However, as we were playing it, if yeah. you're kind of there, yeah. clink, yeah, you're in. If you're basically yeah. within arm's reach, yeah. you're in. Anyway... When you're in base-to-base -base combat, or base-to-base -base contact, it costs you a single action point. The character's combat value will indicate his fighting skill. Pick as many die as the value indicated in the character's combat attribute. A character can never deliberately attack a friendly model in close combat. Now we will see the difficulty he must reach in his attack roll. So it, it's important to note that an attack roll is actually different to shooting and other such roles yes because instead of the standard difficulty of seven you are going up against the opponent's dexterity value correct so if for example i had my fish man here who if i check my sheet had a uh, combat roll of f or a combat score of four that means my dice pool for that guy would be four so i get my three die and my uh, destiny die but what I'm aiming for is his dexterity. And I thought, well, what's his dexterity? So I'm going to say it was, uh, it's know, actually five. It's quite it's high. five. So I'm looking for fives, basically, and above um, to try and hurt him. So that's all aces. That would be all aces. So I would be able to do four points of damage. But you would deduct whatever points of damage based on the protection of that model. Mm. So looking at his stat line, if he had a protection of two, and that most of the, the, the units in Carnivale have a kind of a protection of two, you would just deduct two, and then that would be two uh, life points that would be deducted, deducted from that character. Yeah. Simple so, as that. It is as simple as that. It's just one roll for everything, really. However, are there any uh, modifiers? Well, there are some modifiers. For example, if... I um, charged him, and the rules for charge are on page 51. Let me give you a, uh, an idea. Charge costs one action point. The character can make this attack if it moved at least five inches or made a run action directly previous to this attack. So if I made a run towards this guy or moved five inches, now bear in mind the movement of this guy is three, so he couldn't just do a standard move and then mm. do a charge. He'd have to use a run to try and get into this guy and do a charge. However, if he did do it, and I ran f five inches or more and got up to him, I could spend my action point to do a charge, and I would actually gain one die to the die pool for this attack. Yeah. So in that case, I'd have been rolling five dice instead. So more chance to hurt things. Yes. Now, the other thing to bear in mind is uh, the whole concept of multiple attackers. So there, here's how modifiers would work, okay? Allies can aid a character in close combat. In combat where there are three or more models in contact, an, attack, uh, an attacker will gain or remove dice from his combat dice pool based on the relationship of the models in combat. Uh, here's the basics to this, right? The attacker gains one die to their combat dice pool for every ally not in base contact with another enemy. So, so we've got this hybrid guy here. Yep. He's going to come along, come into base contact here to assist his fishy friend. Mm -hmm. So if he was the last to move, he would obviously be the one that would be doing the attacking. So whenever he's doing his attacking to this guy, he would actually get an extra dice because that fishman is already in base contact with that um, with that miniature. However, yeah. if uh, one of this guy's, the, the guard's allies, was in contact with that fishman, then he would negate that and you wouldn't get the actual, uh, the, the positive modifier but for that. Point we should uh, bring up just as a question. What happens if we start getting a chain going along like that? 
That is a video for another day yeah. where we will sit and work that one out. But at its most basic, yeah. that's how it operates, okay? Um, now, this has a two dice maximum. Yes. So if you're thinking of a big long chain or whatever, it's not really going to matter. Yeah, you, you know? can't be getting a conga line. You're not, yeah, it, it's a conga line of mayhem. It has a two <laughs> dice maximum anyway. Well, the, the however, nobles have gone out of hand. However, if I remove him from the equation and have him there, and this is our guy doing an attack on him, because another enemy is in base contact with him, he actually loses a die in that point. And that kind of simulates, one simulates the fact that uh, your your buddy's in there sinking the head yeah. in too, whereas this simulates the fact that you're fighting this guy but also trying to yeah. keep out of the way of your that guy at the same time. Your attention is split two directions. And that's a minus two dice maximum. Yes. Okay? So it goes two dice either way. So if you've got buddies in the fray and uh, they're not in base contact so with an enemy, you can get up to two dice. And if you've got enemies in the fray and your bodies are not in there with you, you could get up to minus two dice. But just saying, say if this guy was completely surrounded by all of these guys, he'd only be taking minus two to his dice rather than yeah. the three. So what if I get a critical hit? Okay? okay. So criticals and fumbles. If you roll a critical during close combat, the target of the attack gains a stun counter. And if you've been watching our videos on shooting and stuff like that, you'll know that stun counters are actually very good. Um, or bad. Or bad, depending on how you look at it. So if he is a stun counter, it means that any other stun that he gets, including from shooting or whatever else, until he gets rid of that stun counter, they are going to count as hits. Yeah. And they're going to gradually take him down through his pain thresholds. You can shoot into combat. So that's very bad news when you're, on, yeah. when you're stunned. The stun is a very important aspect of this game and not to be overlooked. Definitely don't overlook it. It's a big component of this game. If, however, you fumble, the attacking character um, can have an attack of opportunity. Okay? Um, so... Let me give you uh, an idea of the attack of opportunity. If you go to attack this guy mm -hmm. and you have uh, a fumble, so in other words, you've rolled a one on the destiny dice. And you have no other aces. And you have no away. other aces to, to take away. Um, the, your opponent is going to get a free attack of opportunity. It costs no action points and it runs something like this. Sometimes a character makes a mistake or takes an action, an action that leaves him exposed to a foe. Their foe can take advantage of that opportunity, typically with an attack. Attacks of opportunity are triggered in three ways. Because a character fumbled an attack, a character is trying to disengage from another character, which we'll be discussing a little later in this video, um, uh, or the character is uh, casting a spell. So you have some vulnerability when you're actually trying yeah. to cast a spell. But basically, when your attention is distracted and you're vulnerable in some way to yeah. a, a quick attack of opportunity. When an attack of opportunity is triggered, it costs no action points to make the attack against the triggering character. And attacks of opportunity are always close combat attacks. And in order to make an attack of opportunity, a character must be wielding a close combat weapon. Okay, um, And attacks of opportunity are resolved during the turn of the character triggering the opportunity. So you don't have to wait to your turn to get your attack of opportunity. It happens in his turn. If he's fluffed and fumbled, you get an immediate attack in that, in that turn. And immediately after the triggering action, but before resolving the triggering actions events. Okay, So attack of opportunity, the model that is abandoned, um, this is, uh, in terms of making the attack of opportunity, it's just run the same way as a normal attack. Now, here's a question I have that I'm going to throw out to the ether while I think about it for a minute. If I fumble during an attack of opportunity, does that then convey an attack of opportunity on the guy mm. who I was doing an attack of opportunity? Okay. Interesting question. And I believe the answer is no. Ah. So you do not get an attack of opportunity from a fumbled attack of opportunity. So just in case you're, you're wondering about that, because I was certainly wondering about that. <laughs> right, moving on. That's your basic combat. Yeah, that's just okay. the basics. But we've been talking all along about how cinematic 
this game is, okay? So is there even more cinematic kind of combat actions and stuff that we can oh, take? Oh, yes, there is. Well, we discussed charge, where you can run into somebody and get a plus one modifier because you've charged them. But where do you get a load of some of these optional rules in the combat? So on page 51, you're going to find what are called combat maneuvers, okay? There's a whole load of them there. There is a whole load of them. And here's some of our favorites, okay? First up, the roundhouse attack. Yes. Now, let's get this uh, in some kind of uh, setup, okay? So here we have my little hybrid, um, and he's surrounded by three um, of Sam's army. Now, let's imagine my little hybrid was actually a bit better than what yes. he was, and he, and he had a big old sword. He could do what's called a roundhouse attack, and that would cost him two action points, okay? The character can make an attack against each of the models with which he is in base contact, and each attack will be resolved separately in the direction, clockwise or counterclockwise, determined by the attacker. So I could take a look at the guys that are surrounding me and say, actually, this guy is weaker than these two guys, so I'm going to attack in this direction, okay? Because you'll understand why in a second. If any of the attacks don't cause the loss of at least one life point, the attack stops. Mm. It can't make any more. So it's basically been blocked. Yeah, so you want to know your enemy, which is a, it's an old Beast of War tip that we've been giving out for ages. Know your enemy. Read your enemy's book and understand where they're weak. That's why I hang around Daryl. <sighs> yeah, but in this case... Um, Actually, in this case, this guy and this guy are pretty much exactly the same, so yeah. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. really matter. But if there was a weakness, if it was, for example, like this, I would probably attack from that direction. Yeah. Because these are like, these are the bar and the body. They're almost the secondary yeah. level of noble. Well, this is just my grunt, the guard. Yeah. So and I'm trying to cut through, but I have to cause a piece of, of life damage on him. And then I have to cause some life damage on him before I would get finally to her to cause some life damage on her. So it's a devastating attack if you have a good, really good weapon to pull it off with. Um, with my uh, little hybrid, it's probably not worth it. No, that. he's just got a dagger. I don't think he could do it. <laughs> <laughs> I shall remove your buttons. <laughs> anyway, next Fly up, me at the bar. we have the low blow again on page 51. And you'll enjoy this one. I certainly did. A low blow costs two action point, and a low blow, as it says in the book, is an attack to a specific weak spot. Mm. I wonder where that is. <laughs> you must announce Elbow. that you must announce that you want a character to make a low blow before making the combat roll. When you make the roll, reduce the combat dice pool by one as the character's accuracy is reduced because he's trying to hit a specific yeah. spot. <laughs> so say if I had a combat value of four, yep. I'd have to take away one you because would. I'm so busy focusing on that one particular area I want to hit. Yes. Don't you say a word. I'm not going to say a word. <laughs> if the attack gets to uh, cause any damage at all, um, applying the target's protection, because even that area yeah. is protected, the target only loses one Especially life point. Especially that area is yeah. protected. The target only loses one life point, but receives a stun counter. So if, for example, you rolled and you got uh, three aces, okay, and they, it would deduct two, you would get the one life point, but you would also get a stun counter on there as well. Yeah. And as we keep yeah. saying, stun counters are important in this game. Yeah, so, get a load of stun counters on them. Yes, absolutely. Uh, next up, we have Attack from Above. Oh, this is a good one. I've set up uh, Sir Pantalone ready for it. Excellent. So Attack from Above is uh, on page 49. So it's, well, actually, no, it's not. It's on page 51. Where are we at? Strike from Above. This costs a single action point. The character can make this attack if it made a running jump or a jump down action during the action previous and the character gets a plus one to damage when it makes this attack. So, he makes a jump down. Uh, I'm going to move him out of the way and yeah. move our fish man in the thing. Of course. He'd make a jump down and then attack that. And because he jumped down in the previous uh, action, 
he gets a plus one to his attack on that turn. So it's like yeah. down on he, somebody's head. Basically showing he's got a lot more force behind the blow because of the m momentum of his fall. Yeah, so just to recap there, if they made a running jump or a jump down, so remember, you don't have to be up high. You could say, well, hang on a second. I've made um, yeah. up to, say, five inches of a move. I'm now going to make a running jump instead of a charge to try and get to this guy. So if, for example... It was done across the the. Oh, that yeah, that's a good point. You could yeah. running jump over a canal into combat. And how cool is that? Because you couldn't charge through a no, canal. No, no. But you could do a move, a running jump, and that would be an attack from above. How cinematic is that? You could also do that, say, if there was a, um, as we said earlier, the whole. You can only fit so many miniatures into an alleyway. Yeah, into the one if spot. If there's one blocking your charge and you want to get around it to the other one you can basically wall run around that jump off strike yes it's extraordinary isn't it yeah right so um that's how you would do attack from above or it's actually called strike from above okay next up we have a uh, two weapon combat which is on page 49 i uh, just need to go back a little bit so two weapon combat if your guy is fitted out with, say, a sword and a dagger, okay, you can spend an action point, and some characters will have the ability to fight using two weapons at the same time. Models with the ambidextrous universal uh, ability can wield these two weapons at the same time, as long as neither weapon has the two-handed weapon ability. So if it's, if it's a big axe or something, yeah. you're not going like to wield that. Like this guy, he's got a big halberd, but yeah. he's not going to be able to... Yeah, it's more that. like this guy here yeah. who has both a sword and a dagger. Yeah, okay? you have to state which of those weapons is your primary weapon. So Correct. So which one you'd be getting the bonuses for. When a character is fighting with two weapons, you must always make clear which is the primary weapon. And when the character, uh, when the character makes its close combat attack, fighting with two weapons allows that character to re-roll one missed dice in its combat roll as if it had the reroll dice one ability, but without having to spend a karma point. So if he came in with his sword, okay, mm -hmm. and spent the point on the two-handed weapon attack, okay, he could hit him with his sword, but he'd get to reroll one of those dice as if yeah. he's gone in with the sword and uh, in with the dagger. Actually, the uh, correct fencing stance would be that sort of thing. Yes. Okay, we love it, Sam. Next up, we have push, which is an awesome, awesome rule. You'll find it on page 51. So, uh, push. This one was the bane of my existence in our game. Sam enjoyed this one. So, you all know by now that it's a very, very three-dimensional game. Okay, so you can be up on top of buildings, jumping from rooftop to rooftop, jumping from balconies, making runs across uh, the front of buildings, doing all kinds of things. So with a three-dimensional game, there's always the opportunity to push somebody off a roof. Nice. <laughs> so push works a bit like this. When you make a push attack, it's going to cost you two action points, and it's considered an unarmed attack. You move a, f a foe instead of dealing damage. You make an attack roll as normal, but for each ace obtained before applying the target's protection, so he does get his protection on this, the character pushes its foe one inch away from it. If the push causes the target to come into contact with some impassable, impassable scenery, such as a building or the table's edge, the target suffers one damage for every inch of movement beyond the point where he stopped. Yeah, so let's take, for example, if we put this building here. Yep. And you've just pushed this guy right up against the wall. Yeah, so say I scored a push of seven inches. Yes. Okay, and I've pushed them into this wall, which was what, say two inches away? Yeah. That means that there was five additional inches of energy that went into that wall, basically. And that would give me um, five additional damage um, that he would then have to apply. Yeah. So have to take them. a push can cause a target to fall into the water off a building or elevated scenery, in which case the falling rules would apply. And if you're interested in the falling rules, we went through them in a previous video. 
A model that has been pushed is automatically disengaged, ignoring the disengage from combat rules. And if the push causes the target to come into base combat with another foe, it is then engaged with that new foe. So let's think yep. about this for That's a second. That's a useful little thing. Yeah, so if we um, push um, this little guy here, our hybrid, it's not a particularly killy character, okay? But he's going to have a go at pushing him, and he pushed this guy into this guy. And then he'd get his ass kicked <laughs> by my fish man. I like it. it I it's like a it a lot. It's a great way of almost playing pass the parcel with your enemies. Yeah. Now, another one that we're going to throw out. It, whenever you um, do the attack roll as normal for the, the push, it has... The character has already removed aces based on its protection that must mean that the one damage for every inch of movement or beyond that is not affected by its protection at that point it's just pure and utter damage so yeah. it's just in case you guys are wondering does that damage itself get affected by the protection no the protection has already been used to remove aces from the roll this is not aces this is damage so it's effective damage is just applied straight so to the So sometimes character. it can be more painful to shove someone against the w a wall. Than to actually yeah. fight them. Yeah. Possibly. We'll it, see. It, you're basically slamming them against the wall yeah, with superhuman strength. Yeah, but you're, you're basing it on the fact that I said a 7-inch push. Yeah. You're probably unlikely to get a 7-inch push. Yeah, so. that's... Do you know what? Try it out for yourselves, guys. It's, it's, uh, it'll be a tactical decision you have to make yourself on that one. Right. Finally, um, I want to talk a little bit about Trample, okay? Uh, trample is a single action point. It's an unarmed attack. Models with a size category of large or larger, uh, larger, larger, may trample smaller models, okay? The character obtains a plus one die to his attack pool for each size category it is larger than a target size. Hmm. So, I don't think we have any large ones here, so I don't think we could... Oh. Uh, we do have a large one here. Yep. Um, oh, I'm guessing that must be these deep ones. Yes. So, that deep one, I'm just going to try and find the page here because it's just in the back of the book. That deep one is a large size, okay? Okay. And he has the opportunity to trample over a medium size, okay? That would be any that of the be, others. That would be any of the others, okay? However, um, a huge size can like. trample over a large size and trample over a medium size and because he's you know i think he's twice bigger than a medium size he'd apply yeah. double so he would yep. i'm just interested in how big the huge size ah yeah so and a little bird tells me they're going to get bigger than that again so you never know so it's a, yeah, a it's huge size you get plus one die to his attack pool for each size category it is larger than its target size so mm. um the huge size is going to get plus two die a large side is going to get plus one die. So that's your yeah. trample. You're basically walking all over them. Okay. Um, can I interrupt? Uh, I don't know. I wasn't talking. Can, <laughs> can I interrupt an opponent like I can with a ranged attack? So in ranged, we've talked about being at the ready. You can use it in close combat as well. We may have yep. discussed it a little bit, but now's a good chance to actually go into a little detail and show you exactly how it works. So, when in combat, it's, it's quite simple. Whenever you put a character into at the ready, it has to be the last action that you take. So, if you did it at the start of your turn, you'd waste the rest of the action points. So, so it has to be the last action say you do. We, in my last turn, I put the, this In the guy. last action of his yeah. turn, you put him into at the ready. Yes. That means that when my fishman attacks him, he doesn't just automatically roll his combat. It becomes an opposed roll. Okay? Yep. So, Sam, let's show an opposed roll. Okay. Let's say I have a combat of five, mm -hmm. and you'd have a combat of what? Uh, Ten. <laughs> now, my combat is going to be four for that guy. That's a put should say you can never have a dice pool of over 10 dice. Oh, there's a good rule to remember. So I would have a, I'd have a combat pool of four uh, okay. versus and your I'd five. Have. Yeah. So I've moved my Ugru Rashar uh, into close combat yes. with, the, with this guy. Yeah. So the unpronounceable uh, fish man Ugru is... Ugru Rashar. Fish man. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it is... Uh, 
we're both going to make an opposed roll based yes. on our, mm -hmm. our combats, but rather than it rolling against the dexterity, we're back onto the regular seven. Yes. Okay. So, uh, my guy, uh, the Ogru Rashar, has a, he has a sh uh, combat, combat pool of four, and you have a combat pool yep. of five. My guy, the noble leader, is a little better. Now, before we make the roll, this is the point where you need to take into account weapons and things like that. We're yeah. not really doing it. We're just playing as if they've got flat weapons, just their combat against combat. However, weapon profiles do make a difference. For example, Claws by the Ugru Rashar um, just damages with aces. There's no plus or minus to that. So whatever aces you score is the damage you do. But he has penetration one, which means that he can ignore one point of uh, protection from his opponent okay so just mm. bear that in mind whereas my guy has a sword he has a sword which yeah. does aces plus one so whatever sam rolls aces wise is going to be another one uh, in there and he has ability of save one which uh, means that before i even get to roll sam can remove one of my dice from my uh, dice pool before we even yeah. start but, and that's the yeah. parry, uh, parrying the sword in a fencing type technique yeah, but as we said, we're not really using that just to give you the basic ideas of how this plays. Okay. Okay. But yes, so we will use it. Okay. For, the, for this demonstration, we will. So I'm going to roll three instead and of I'm four. I'm still rolling my five. And you're still rolling your five. So let's see how this would play out. Okay. I have two aces plus one because of my sword. So yep. three aces. And I have just the one. So, so I've been beaten. It's not going to make any difference. So that means that you're three aces. I deduct my protection, and I have protection of three. Therefore, Sam, you did nothing to me. Ah, oh, well, it le however, it's a good way of preventing however, damage. However, at least you got the opportunity yeah. to do something to me, and it stopped me from doing a lot more damage to you. Yeah. So at the ready, a very, very useful uh, action point that you can spend. Finally, let's say these guys are locked in combat, Sam. Okay. How do we get out of a combat? And if you want to find out, you can turn to page 50 in the main rulebook or on the downloadable rule, rules, and you can see uh, an entry in there in terms of engaging and disengaging from combat. Okay. Um, in order for two characters to fight in close combat, they must be engaged in base contact. We know. Uh, for this to happen, one of them must have invested part of its movement to be in base contact with his foe. However, later on, if one of the characters can um, and wishes to step away from his foe, and he still has the remaining action points to be able to do this movement, he must make an unengaged maneuver. Simply announcing his intention to move, the abandoned fighter can react in two ways. One, I can let him go, and I'll get a free uh, attack of opportunity. So Which I get a, we've covered earlier. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, two, I can try and grab you and stop you from getting away, so I can try to block his escape. So one, the attack of opportunity. The model that is abandoned can make an attack of opportunity on the character that's trying to escape. I can hit my foe for zero action points before he steps away, regardless of whether the abandoned model has been previously activated or is even in at the ready. Once this attack is resolved, the character leaving the combat can then move freely. However, two, I can, it's called relocating. On the second case, the character wishing to escape must invest the necessary action points for the movement he wants to do. So you yeah. would decide whether you're going to spend one or two action points. Um, then we both make a, dex a dexterity opposing role. Okay? Okay. So if the character trying to escape wins or draws, he can move freely and continue on his turn normally. However, if the character that wanted to keep fighting wins, he can relocate at no cost anywhere in base contact with the model that tried to escape. And they're still engaged in combat, and the model that tried to escape can't move at all. So that works a bit like this. If you are trying to get away, and you're trying to get away up to here because there's an objective or something on the bridge, yeah. we do an opposing uh, rule based on uh, our dexterity, okay? So I have a dexterity of six, so I'll be using six dice. And I have a dexterity of four. This is just on sevens, guys, okay? So your standard sevens aces, okay? I got a crit and a nine, so two aces and a crit. 
Okay, I got a critical and a nine. So it's a draw, Sam, yeah. okay? Which means that the character is trying to get away, just walks away, okay? However, if I had won it, okay? Let's see if I can get another critical. There we go. Or no, another well, critical, sorry, another, another, ace. another ace. You stay where you are, but I have the ability to move. Yeah. And where that becomes useful is I could just spin around like that. Blocking my way to the objective. Blocking your way to the objective. So if it seems a bit strange at start, well, well why would I move? That's why you might move. You might spin around the character so as you can stop him from uh, getting away to wherever he's trying to go. Yeah. So there you have it. That's how you would run away from combat or not, as the case may be. So we hope you're enjoying the coverage, guys. If you have any questions, post them in the comments below, and we'll do our best to get them answered for you. And other than that, stay tuned as we look at the likes of magic and all the other gorgeous elements of Carnivale. See ya. Thank <laughs> you.